here we go. So yesterday we talked a little bit about kind of what led up to this first war. Um, the main reason was that, you know, I mean, there had been some clash between Japan, uh, Japan and China, specifically involving Korea. So to be very clear, this first war that we talk about is between two powers, Japan and China, and it is over the territory of Korea. Okay. That's, that's kind of what's happening here. So what we do know is that the man who was pro-Japanese in Korea was murdered by the Chinese and displayed as a warning, essentially. Um, but the biggest thing, the actual event that led to Japan being able to send troops into Korea was that China violated the Ito or the Lee Ito Convention, which said that both countries would remove troops. And if anybody stepped foot, soldiers stepped foot into Korea, that was a violation. So that's what happened um, when the Chinese government sent troops into Korea to aid with a rebellion that was going on. Okay. Okay. So China tried to send reinforcements to aid against the 8,000 new coming Japanese but the Japanese sunk the British, it was actually a British steamer carrying them, but they sunk the steamer carrying the reinforcements. So that did not go well. And as soon as the Japanese had sunk that steamer, war was declared. So August 1st, August 1st 1894, war was declared. Most foreigners, specifically the other European powers that are kind of sitting back and watching this unfold, they predicted an easy victory for the much, much more massive Chinese forces. They were like, oh, this is not going to be a problem for China. Yes. The Chinese army was less weaponized, right? Correct. So therein lies the real problem, is that Japan had done a better job at modernizing and were significantly better trained and better equipped than the Chinese army. So numbers didn't really matter in this case. Because remember, the reason that we're having all of this conflict in Korea is because Japan rep represents modernization and China represents kind of the older traditional ways. And that also goes for their military prowess. And, you know, that just... As we've seen in Japan itself with some of their civil wars, the modern military strategies dominate the older military strategies because of firepower. And so this marks the first Sino-Japanese War. The start of the first Sino-Japanese War. So Sino is a Latin term that means China. Questions so far? Yes. Would you say that today's slides are much different than yesterday? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh. You said, oh. No. I mean, we're talking about two wars. There's not a lot to look at, a lot to say. Yeah. Are there, like, photos of these battles? Is there written? No, there's not. Because remember, cameras at this point, you have to basically sit, sit perfectly still for quite a long period of time to be captured by a photograph. So we're still dealing with artwork of a lot of the battles, but, um, and lots of maps today. Guys, yeah, exactly. No, put down the camera. Right. World War I is really the first time we have photographs of a war. So close to this, but just slightly later. We're still, you know, 20-ish years away from having like actual photographs. Ready? Okay, so we know this war begins in August of 1894 and it actually ends with China's defeat in April of 1895. So this war only lasts nine months. 
It's a short one. And it's short because there are overwhelming victories immediately. Japan moves quickly, both by land and by sea, and shatters China's defenses. A lot of the problem is that China is under the Qing dynasty right at, at this point, and they were incredibly corrupt by this stage. They weren't um, communicating throughout their, you know, the ranks and their military, and so there were there was a lot of confusion as to whether or not they were supposed to even engage in uh, with the Japanese, and so they they basically were caught by surprise every single time. They were like, what are we supposed to do? And by that point, they were already there. So, right, like, and we're going to die. So, yeah, it involved fighting on two fronts. The first front was in Korea and into Manchuria after crossing the Yalu River. So this is the first army, the first wave that comes in from Japan, comes up. This is through uh, Busan, goes all the way through Korea. This is the border. This Yalu River is the border between um, Korea and Manchuria. Manchuria is technically part of China at this point. It's kind of a weird gray area. Um, but this is the first wave. The second group is on the Laodong Peninsula here. This is what it was called at the time. This is what it's called now, which is why it's just slightly different um, names. The second group is here. That peninsula is incredibly important to trade, right? Because it's China's connector between Beijing and Korea. Okay, so that port, Port Arthur, which is at the very tip um, of the Laojong Peninsula is the most important port in that area. And also look, it's like completely surrounded. So it's very safe harbor there. So that's where the second group is. The Japanese also actually led a third assault on the Chinese island of Formosa, which is now Taiwan, um, which is right down here. So the Japanese had them here from Japan. They have them down south. Beijing is, mm, I wanna say like right here, if I remember correctly. Um, it's been a while since I've been there. But then we've got two ports here that they're dealing with. Really, yeah, Port Arthur and Wei Highway. Um, right here are the two main ports and you've got Japanese ships in this harbor and all the way through this island chain the Ryukyu island chain not allowing anything from China out so they are trapped one yeah one port cuts out the entire nation they don't have China being as large as it is at this point because of Manchuria. They don't have a ton. I mean, obviously they have a huge amount of coast, but they don't have a lot of port cities because it's open ocean most of the time. So those aren't great for port cities. You need like a little harbor. So it's a little bit different. Um, by March 1895, Japan had successfully invaded the Shangang province as well as Manchuria. So we're dealing with a large section of northern China that is now in Japanese control. Both of these areas had fortified posts that commanded the sea approaches to Beijing, and so they had completely cut off the Chinese from their own capital. They were trapped and terrified and immediately sued for peace. The Japanese caught them completely off guard. They were not ready for the um, intensity of this assault. There weren't any major notable battles in this war that we need to talk about, but you do need to know that the Chinese did not win a single battle, which is not normal. Usually you have some back and forth, even if it's an overwhelming victory, there's a little bit of back and forth, but they didn't win any of them. 
they fought a lot harder in Taiwan than they did in China itself, which is odd. Um, the Japanese lost more people in Taiwan than they did in the rest of the war combined. Which isn't many, I'll be honest with you. It's significantly less than the Chinese. Ready? They did, but they were so disorganized that, I mean, it was literally like walking up to a group of untrained civilians with the best soldiers in the world. Is essentially what happened. Like, even though the soldiers were there, the, the orders were not coming down from the top fast enough until after the battle was already over. And then it was like, it doesn't matter, we're dead. Like, <laughs> we've been captured. So, they were, China's main goal at this point is to keep their capital safe because they know that Japan is in, is about to attack the capital. Yeah, Japan was about ready to end China. Yeah, Japan was right. That's exactly right. They were done. Okay, ready? So let's look at a little few of the numbers. So the Japanese took 240,000 men um, into battle. That is 240,000 soldiers in both the Korea and Chinese campaigns, as well as 154,000 laborers behind the scenes. However, they only lost 1,400 people to battlefield fatalities total. So we're talking, they did not lose very many people. There were some that died from illness and the severe winter conditions that they were dealing with. Um, they also took another 50,000 troops and 26,000 laborers in Formosa. They lost about three, I think they lost four to 5,000 of those. So higher than in China, but still relatively low considering the numbers that they took in. Chinese casualties, on the other hand, were much higher. We actually do not have a total, but I can give you an example. In the Battle of Port Arthur alone, it's estimated that approximately 60,000 Chinese soldiers and civilians were killed in that one battle. And there's like 25 to 30 battles in this war. So significantly higher. We're talking maximum the Japanese lost less than 10,000 people total in the entire war to all causes. Whereas the Chinese lost 60,000 in one battle. So not great, but this gives you an idea of how brutal and fast this war was. I actually don't think they did at this point because they had really been resisting westernization of any kind. Um, and the Qing dynasty was incredibly corrupt and disorganized at this point in history. They were, the Qing dynasty was falling essentially, but hadn't completely come out yet. So no, very disorganized army. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. It was, I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous what ended up happening. China was like, taunt Japan, taunt Japan, taunt Japan, thinking that they would just sit there and take it. And Japan was like, yeah, we're not going to do that. So I'm actually like seeing how this all went. It's shocking that Japan didn't march on Beijing anyways. Um, it tells you that their intent was not to go after China, but instead to get Korea. That was what they wanted. Um, but otherwise they would have taken China out immediately. Cause if they wanted to at this stage, they could have do what? Yeah, that's exactly right. They were very, very, I mean, like, it, it would have been nothing to march on Beijing at this point for them. They could not have been stopped. Um, but for whatever reason, mainly because of the European powers that were in China that we'll talk about in a little bit, it was Europe that made them a little nervous to march on Beijing, not China. <laughs> so it's an interesting situation that we'll get to because let's be clear, Europe is also in the area. Most of Europe is 
is around. So, and Japan was still a little weary of them considering their recent situation. Yes. Yeah, so Europe in general is expanding big time right now. And it's weird because they're losing territory and trying to gain more at the same time. They're freaking out because a lot of the territory that they've held for a really long time is wanting independence. Um, and so they're trying to gather up basically anything that hasn't already been claimed. So it's a strange situation. And Africa and Asia are the two areas that they really hadn't had a historical tie to. So that's where they're going. Most of the like, previous provinces and stuff became independent around the time of right before World War I. Right, exactly. So they're still trying to get it. Right, exactly. So it's right in this time. There's multiple wars for independence going on. India in particular, the British are freaking out because they're about to lose India. So they're trying to grab up territory in China so they don't lose that Asian trade. So it's not, things are not going well, like for, for European imperialism. <laughs> okay, ready? Yes. So we have the Treaty of Shimonoseki, and that is the treaty that ends this war. With its navy completely obliterated and Beijing in danger of being captured, China has to ask for peace. Like, they're like, we have got to pursue peace, otherwise it's over. So this treaty ended the conflict and it was signed on April 17th, 1895. These were the terms. China had to officially recognize Korea's independence. They ceded Taiwan, the Pescadores, and the Laodong Peninsula in Manchuria to Japan, including Port Arthur. So the area that Japan had captured during the war was officially given to them. That's a big power grab for Japan because they've just taken one of China's main ports. They also agreed to pay a large indemnity. Basically what that means is China is paying a massive amount of money to cover the military costs that Japan spent during the war. This indemnity situation comes into play big time in World War I and it leads directly to World War II if you're not aware of how these payments work. Yeah, China was incredibly wealthy. But they didn't have China. Right, but they also had one, two, three, four, four to five different conflicts going on at the same time. So they were losing money. They were hemorrhaging money pretty quickly because you had the opium wars as well as this war going on simultaneously. And the Boxer Rebellion is about to happen. So like none of it, and all of this is related. We'll hopefully get to that today. They also had to give Japan trading privileges on Chinese territory. So Japan could come in at any time and trade with the European powers that were in China. And China was not allowed to say anything. So again, massive power grabs. They're like, we can come into your land at any time for any reason, so long as it is for trade. Right, exactly. All the soldiers, no big deal, it's fine. So this is what puts Japan as a leading power on a global stage. This isn't just Japan's the strongest country in Asia. We already knew that. Now it's like, oh, wait a second. They could probably compete with the European powers who hadn't even come close to conquering China. And Russia had been trying for like centuries. Yeah, and Japan said, mm, mine. Or your countries. And that's exactly right. You're like, these terms are all for Japan and not for China at all. And then you realize that Japan is allowing China to continue to exist. And this is what they get for it. If you just think about number of people and physical area of the two countries, it is unreal that Japan was able to pull this off. All of the European powers were shocked. They were like, whoa, we 
misjudged you, you tiny island. I am so sorry. We will pay more attention. <laughs> but the attention that they pay isn't specifically positive, which, especially with Russia. Kayla was going to get me food, but I just really, I'm thirsty. I <laughs> need a drink. It's a problem. That, that's exactly right. Like I, I'm constantly talking. And so it's like, ugh. yeah. And then it will bite you. <laughs> yes, exactly. We'll rip your face off. That's exactly right. They're not great. My mom has two, and I don't love them. <laughs> yeah. True. That's true. This one, this one has some bite. Yeah. Yeah. This is more of like a like a All right. Are we ready? Okay, so I want to show you this political cartoon that was put in a French newspaper around this time. So this lets you know that the rest of the world is paying attention to what's going on. So we have Japan here. We know it's Japan because of the costume, because of the samurai hairstyle. This is China, very typical Confucian. Um, they are trying to fish for this fish here. What does this say? It's in French, remember? Kure, which is Korea. Okay, good. And this is Russia, just kind of watching. And they're like, huh, hasn't really thrown the line in the water, watching to see what happens. So this lets you know what's about to occur. Russia was literally sitting back and watching this unfold saying, that's interesting. So maybe China isn't what I need to be going after. Maybe it's Japan. Okay. Um, so we are dealing with a threat. The European powers were extremely alarmed by Meiji Japan's rise. And I say meteoric rise because obviously this country who they barely knew existed, who had been closed for hundreds of years to the outside world, all of a sudden opens up and in a matter of 20 years has gone from nobody knew anything about them to they are taking on the world's largest superpower and oldest country, right? Not only taking them on, but destroying them. So they are nervous, to say the least. Three of these powers, Russia, Germany, and France, are not happy about Japan's seizure of the Laodong Peninsula, specifically Port Arthur. Remember, I told you Port Arthur was going to be incredibly important to this. This is one of the ports in Manchuria. Russia has wanted this port because of trade, right? So we're looking, here's Korea. This is Port Arthur right here. This is the Ladong Peninsula. This is Port Arthur right at this tip. This is all of China, okay? And then we have Japan here, the Philippines down here. This is Formosa, which is now Taiwan. So you can see that this port would be huge in all of this different European trade. So the three powers start to put pressure on Japan into giving up this peninsula to Russia in exchange for a much larger indemnity payment. The emperor, who is still relatively young at the time, accepts this. Japan takes a much larger, and we're talking like 30 million larger, indemnity payment, and at this time that's huge, um, in exchange for the peninsula, which he doesn't really need because of Japan's proximity to all of this, right? Like they could easily use Kyushu as a port rather than this. So he's like, eh, not a big deal. However, Japan's military leaders are not happy. They see this as a slight. They see it as um, humiliating. They don't want to bow down to the European powers, and this slight is not going to be forgotten anytime soon. I feel like 
the Japanese have been so lucky during like this time, but it's like not they're not gonna get lucky very soon. Yeah, they, it's their luck's about to run out. Well, they were lucky until World War Two, where they started using the pure skill to fight, which didn't end well. Right. Because you know America can blow up entire islands. This war with Russia does not go well. I mean, they win, but they shouldn't have. See, it seems like all of the like wars with outside countries are always less difficult for them than the civil wars. Mm -hmm. to... Yeah, the civil wars are really intense. Yeah. So, just kind of looking at this map, I know it's kind of difficult to see. We're going to talk about what this is in a little bit, and I have the same map, I believe, later. Um, but you've got a lot going on. So this is Korea, which now is independent, but really it's owned by Japan. We already know this. Um, you have Japan, you have Formosa, which is also Japanese. The Philippines are occupied by the US around this time. Um, you have uh, Kwang Chao Wan and this little area, which there's British and French spheres of influence in, in uh, Southeastern Asia at this time. We're talking like the Vietnam area, the Laos area, and Southern China. You also have a massive British and German, as well as Japanese sphere of influence in here. Um, we'll talk about what happens with these in a little bit. These two are very specific. Um, and then Russia and Japan have a sphere of influence in upper and northern China. So China is everybody else's at this point. And when I say sphere of influence, it means they're not technically a territory of these countries, but these countries have been allowed, forcibly allowed <laughs> into China to trade and to you know kind of take over certain areas so we've got a lot of european powers as well as japan not just in china but in all of asia at this point japan is the only asian nation that's holding its own and korea is able to hold its own solely because japan has forced it away from china does that make sense yeah yes so japan has korea or is korea just the terms of the of the um, treaty say that Korea is independent, but what that really means is that Korea is open for international trade because Japan needs them to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's it's kind of strange. Korea has never been able to really assert its independence on its own. It's not strong enough to. Um, and they are their proximity to the other larger countries, specifically they're sandwiched in between China and Japan, is not great for them because they're sandwiched in between two very aggressive nations, and they're not very aggressive themselves. Now they are part of them, um, which is why, like it, the the prevalence of North Korea makes more sense now that you can see what Korea's history looks like. The reason there's such a militaristic society existing today in this area is because of everything that built up to this. They've, they've been stepped on for centuries. It's not right by any stretch of the imagination, but you kind of get why it happened. Okay. Yes. Yes. China goes back and forth between being united and breaking into pieces constantly throughout history. Okay, so let's talk, we're going backwards a little bit because there's some history with Russia here and we need to know what Russia's history in Asia is to understand what happens next. So by the early 17th century, Russia had authority over all of Siberia. Siberia technically is in Asia. You know this, you can see it on the map. It always, it's always strange that a European country goes so far into Asia, but this is why. And they were attempting to move south, but all, all of their attempts had consistently been blocked by China. So they were like, well, this is annoying. I guess we'll just stop here for now. They couldn't make any headway in the 18th century because they were busy with conflicts in Western Europe, specifically with Turkey and the Ottomans. A little scuffle in Greece that they had to deal with. No, the country. <laughs> I, I realized that. You're like, wait. 
However, as Siberia continued to develop and become more populated, it needed sea outlets. It didn't have any, and it needed some like viable trade outlets. And to do that, they had to go through China. There was no way to get a viable trade outlet through Siberia without going south, because you go north and you have ice. So they were like, mm, that's not gonna work, let's go south. So Tsar Nicholas I, earlier, earlier Tsar, resorted to some force toward the end of his term. This is toward the end of Tsar Nicholas I, toward the end of his reign. <laughs> that's what that should say. I mean, technically he did die. That's why his reign ended. So that, you know, at the end. <laughs> Yes, it made Russia extremely upset for the, I mean, they had literally been trying to break into China for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden Japan's like, mine, everything. They're like, wait a second, how did this happen? Yeah. Yes, Russia is not powerful at this point at all. And a royal family that's not doing particularly well and squandering a lot of the country's money. They have way too much territory and not enough money to hold it together. That's the problem. Do what? Very oh, very thinly stretched. And they, they have a lot of land that's not productive. Like Siberia is not productive land. It's, it's frozen tundra. So it's like, what do you do with frozen tundra? Not much, right? And not very many people can survive out there. You definitely can't grow crops out there. So Russia has a vast amount, and this has always been Russia's problem. They have a vast amount of territory not enough people or produce to keep it going and not enough money or authority over all of that space to keep any real hold. They'd have to give up probably two thirds of their territory to become efficient and they won't do it. So here we are. <laughs> okay, so I wanna show you a map. This is an interesting map. Okay, so China's here, and if you can see, I mean, you guys know how massive Russia is, I'm assuming. Like, you need to be aware. All of this gray is essentially, well, and even this is Siberia. It is huge, okay? Most of it is uninhabited or very sparsely inhabited, right? Because it's like, it's, think of Canada. Like, only Canada along the border is really inhabited, but everything above it is Lakeland, and it's really cold. And so nobody really lives up there, just tiny sparse communities. It's similar, um, similar uh, mm, longitude. Okay, so I was like, <laughs> latitude, there we go, got it. Latitude, it's been a minute. Latitude. Yeah, <laughs> longitude, latitude, it takes a second, you got it. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot of area here that's been conquered relatively recently. Like if you look at these dates, uh, when I say relatively recently, I mean in the period that we're talking about. So 16, 1533 to 1689, they take all of Siberia. They're trying to push south slowly into China, but they're not making a lot of headway. Um, so they kind of turn, if you look at the ones that are closer to the time period we talk about, they kind of turn to the Middle East and even parts of um, Northern Africa and try and push that way at this point. So we end up, Alexander I takes a little bit here. Um, Nicholas I, the one that we just talked about, he's going into Kazakhstan and Turkestan and trying to push down and even to even as far as Afghanistan. Um, and then Alexander II, who we'll talk about in a second, he pushes farther into this area, closer to Persia and Afghanistan. But then also, if you look here, this is what we're about to discuss. So he finally makes some headway into Manchuria and into China, because remember Manchuria and China are one and the same at this point. So we're dealing with this area. So they've got Siberia, they're trying to push south, they're met, they've are met. they met with um, resistance at the Chinese border for hundreds of years, but they're about to start to finally make some headway. And a lot of this is because China is so weak because it's fighting with a bunch of other people at this point, okay? So 
In the 1850s, Russian towns and settlements appear along the left bank of the Amur, which is that river that we just looked at. I'm gonna go back to this really fast. This is the Amur River here, okay? It is the border between Siberia and Manchuria, okay? The Chinese government doesn't like this, but there's not a whole lot that they can do about it because they're currently engaged in battle with Britain and France in the Opium Wars. I don't know how much you guys know about Chinese history. I, I would assume a little bit because some of you have taken um, Chinese at, for a while. I'm hoping that you've gone over some history. Um, but the Opium Wars are trade wars specifically with European nations over poppies and other related products. That's why they call them the Opium Wars because um, that's what opium's made from. So there's also a civil war going on called the Taiping Rebellion rebellion which is a peasant uprising so they are stretched thin they have no way to defend themselves so in 1860 china cedes all territory north of the amur river to russia so the way russia just gets this land is they literally just walk in and make settlements and then china doesn't do anything about it and then they give them the land. So Russia's like, cool, that worked, let's try it again. <laughs> this expansionist policy that Russia has begun anew is making the rest of Europe super nervous because they're like, what's to stop them coming west if they're going that far in the east? But they, they didn't really do anything about it, they're just watching. There is a pause in this expansionist policy as the regimes change and other Western conflicts are resolved, specifically the ones we talked about with Turkey. But in 1891, Tsar Alexander III sent his son on a public tour of East Asia and simultaneously begins work on what's now known as the Trans-Siberian Railway. Tsar Alexander III is the son of Nicholas I. His son, Alexander III's son, would come to be known very shortly as Tsar Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia. In 1894, Tsar Nicholas II, after he has ascended the throne, resumes this expansionist policy. Questions? Feeling okay? Ready? Not quite? Okay. This, this period of time is always interesting to me because there's some overlap, slight overlap from last year and then there will be a little overlap to next year. 
um, because Russia was involved in a, a conflict in Greece specifically during this time, which is why the expansionist policy kind of stopped. And now we're about to deal with the Germans um, because Tsar Nicholas II is the cousin of Emperor William I in Germany. Are y'all going to Germany? Mm -hmm. Did you not see? <laughs> there was a reveal on, on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to show this map one more time. What we're dealing with, the Russians settled along this river. This was originally part of Manchuria or China. And look here, look at this little offshoot. That is real close to Japan. So Japan is not real happy about that kind of taking over of this northern section here, this island. Um, and they're pushing farther and farther. So the river is here, but look, they've just kind of gone a little past. They're like, this is fine. And this Vladivostok is a pretty um, large town for them. That is where the railroad is intended to go. Oh my Lord. Hello. 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 real quick I have a question for you she called you Candace three times okay so this will end up being a th what the Russians want is they want this to be the end point for the Trans-Siberian Railway but it's a new town so it's not it's not really even theirs at this point they've just kind of taken it from China and they've made a town there and they just hope that it works so that's the goal. But in order for this railway to happen, it's going to have to go through a pretty significant chunk of Manchuria. And then you that puts them very close to Japan. So Japan's like, mm, no, don't like that. Okay. So there's a, there's a slight clash. Okay. Japan's victory against China, as well as Russia's determination to expand as much as possible for this railroad, makes this clash inevitable like there's no way to avoid this we knew this was going to happen part of the reason and this is a this is a reminder the russian government was the one who actually when the treaty of shimonoseki happened they were like no we don't like that because they wanted port arthur so nicholas ii is the one who spurred on france and germany to join him in this what's called the triple convention to convince, put pressure on Japan to relinquish control of the Laodong Peninsula. They even went as far as to secure the loan for China to pay for the increased indemnity. So all of that, everything that happened with the Treaty of Shimonoseki afterwards, when Europe got involved, that was Russia's doing specifically. Then, right after that, a year after that, in 1896, Russia concludes an alliance with China against Japan, saying that Russia would guarantee the integrity of Chinese territory against the Japanese if they would allow them, they would allow Russia China would allow Russia to lay the eastern section of the Trans-Siberian Railway across Manchuria. So what the, what the agreement is, is that Russia will protect China against Japan taking territory in China if they're allowed to lay their railway across parts of China. In addition to laying the railway across parts of China, they want the right to administer and patrol land on either side of the railroad with Russian troops. And China, I mean, China doesn't have anything to play here. They're like, it's either you or them, and you seem to want less than they do, so sure, fine.
I know. I would like to fight against that. Europe, that's who. Literally anyone in Europe, because they have also been very confident with their wars recently. Why are everybody else so stupid? Correct. <laughs> It's exactly right. We defeated the one that defeated China. Well, it's, they just beat up with literally every country in Africa. And then they right. Beat a couple that are like lowly countries. What we're dealing with is a clash of overinflated egos. Because what Japan did, yes, they beat China, but they beat China at its weakest point in history. It doesn't really mean anything. What <laughs> the Europeans had been doing was beating countries who had no chance of beating them because they had never seen Western weapons. So both of these groups have incredibly overinflated egos and now they're about to fight each other and realize that, oh, we're better matched than we anticipated. This is gonna be a lot harder than we thought. It's interesting. Ready? No? Okay. We only have one more slide for today. Only one. <laughs> and it has a picture. <laughs> There's text too, but it has a picture. All the those pictures of Russian leaders make them like look like little kids. Yeah, it's really weird. Their faces are really childish and then their uniforms are like really detailed and Mm-hmm. You guys are gonna laugh really hard at this next picture. It's also from a, a French magazine. No, I don't think this one is French. I think this one might have been American actually. We'll see. Not really. <laughs> the US sort of. The US gets involved in the next slide. <laughs> but in a really weird way. They they do stay out of the fighting. But You'll see, it's dumb. When I heard it, I was like, of course we did. Of course we did that. Why wouldn't we do that? Belgium was taking like a lot of Africa. It was just kind of controlling the territory of Africa. I'd say controlling. Yeah. Like torturing them into getting rubber. Yeah. Belgium, Belgium's a weird place. So the Netherlands and Belgium were one country until the late 1800s, until right about now at this point. And so what I taught the first year of global was essentially the same history, but when they did break off they really broke off very strange okay are we ready yes all right so we've got some interesting things happening here this is an actual cartoon from this time period and what's happening is you have china very upset in the background while this is a lovely pizza that you know again french because that's china you see Port Arthur here. You see this is actually Cao Chow here. This is the German, William II. This is the Russian, Nicholas II. You have the Queen of England. You have French Lady Liberty, right? Because we're dealing with the French at this point. Who's that? The Japanese. <laughs> That's Emperor Meiji. Yeah, it's the Japanese. So you have the European powers and Japan fighting over what to do with China, while China in the background is like, dude, do I not get a say in this? Yeah. Did Meiji actually have that haircut because it's like a thing? It's a similar, it's like a small top knot. It's, it's smaller. So, they're horrifying. What is it? Yeah. Um, so now the Russians are very firmly in China, and the other Europeans are like, let me get in on this. So the British demanded Wei Hai and the French take Guangzhou. These are both ports. William II, Emperor of Germany, who is cousin to Nicholas II, annexed Cao Chow and is like, mine, I'll take that. Nicholas II, at the same time, seized Port Arthur for himself. Themselves being Russia, okay? So apparently this treaty that he made with China does not apply if the aggressors are not Japan. So this whole integrity of Chinese territory means nothing if the Europeans want a peace. The Americans 
negotiate an open door trade policy, but they don't go to China to negotiate this. They go to the European powers and say, hey, we want to trade in this area. And China's like, it's mine. And everybody's like, no, 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 sit down. This results in what's called the Boxer Rebellion. How many of you have heard of the Boxer Rebellion? If you have studied Chinese, you should have heard of the Boxer Rebellion. Does anybody know what it is? It's a government-sanctioned peasant revolt against foreign invaders. It is a weird thing that's pretty much only ever happened once. And then Japan and the West get involved, and that's where we'll stop.